we were able to reverse engineer at least half of what the ET uh, uh, propulsion system was and placed in the ET craft and they got it to fly. Could you explain to the audience the amount of people and pro you know, those projects are split up just for that one project? I mean, what are we talking about here? How many different contractors involved? Well, that's where the problem develops mm -hmm. because the more people that knows about this particular project, the more chance of it getting out into the public. Right. And I'll give you an example, a highly classified project pertaining to a communications device that we had, an alien communications device. They were able to communicate long distances with from one planet to another or from Earth to their planet. And we were trying to figure out how it worked. We were in a very, very, very early stages and there was a number of contractors involved in this Tektronix, Motorola, many others. So there was, I, I think, seven or eight different contractors wow. involved in this. So th now you're talking 60 or 70 or 80 people, okay? But going back a little bit, we had a fantastic counterintelligence net built up around Area 51. In fact, believe it or not, every single prostitute that was in Nye County and, and some in, in Esmeralda County were on the government's payroll meaning that we wanted to know every military person that went in to right. be serviced by them. And we wanted to know what they were told. And lo and behold, we had one of our assets or one of the ladies of the night call us and say, we just had this guy come in here and he's talking about some kind of ray that was they could shoot up to another planet and send all these messages on it. Mm. Now, that bit of information is is highly classified. So we had to go out and find out who this sure. person was yeah, and then track that person down. Now we got an espionage investigation going on. And we find the person and we confront the person and the person's trying to build up his status with this, <laughs> this lady of the night, who was, a, he was a regular there. By the way, I work with ray guns, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and so his prestige, so to speak, well, number one, he was a contractor. Right. Um, he was fired, a prime. obviously. A prime contractor, oh. he was fired. We were able to shut her down by saying, every bit of information he gave you is baloney. Right. And she said, I've kind of figured that. You know, people come in here and boast about doing this and that. But okay, all right. Now we got to get him shut down. And that information never did get out anywhere. And that's just one example of what we do as special projects to protect a special access program. So what are the most secret investigations that the PJ branch performs? The most secret investigations are UFO, UAP investigations. Incidents that happen that we don't, we can't understand, or we can't explain, mm -hmm. such as a landing that occurred at, at some particular place near a military installation involving military people. And the ETs wanted specific information from that military person. Now, that would be somewhat of a, a counterintelligence or maybe even a counterespionage investigations, but it's pretty hard to run one of those cases against an ET race that right. flies away. You know, we can't go and interview them or go and do any background investigation on them. So then we have to concentrate on the individual, the, the, the individual that, that Why had they that specifically, concept. you know, pick that individual or just, he was in the right place at the right time. Obviously there's something where they wanted this to happen right outside the base. Well, I, a lot of times they pick the person because he's military right? and the ETs want to know what's going on. They see us flying. They see us flying crafts. They probably have the, the, the most advanced reconnaissance system that any, any entity could have on earth. Why I'm, choose a military police or security police officer? People are probably not briefed on the stuff that we know about. Why choose them? Well, maybe a stepping stone. Mm. You know, it's hard for us uh, to get inside of an ET's mind. Right, we, we, don't, yeah. we don't know anything about the ET. We, we don't know how they think. Mm -hmm. We don't know how they, they can react, their personalities or anything like that. So to try to rationalize uh, how, what their behavior would be, uh, where we could with a, with a KGB agent 
or, or a GRU agent. Well, we can rationalize. We have a lot of data about them. We can look in a database and know exactly how they function. But an ET race coming here and asking this particular security policeman, for instance, the Randlesham Force incident, or the Ellsworth Air Force Base incident, or the Edwards Air Force Base, or the Loring Air Force Base incident, why they particularly picked that security policeman and why they ask him these questions or ask them to do something for them, uh, and we can't understand that. Were you briefed on that exact, you know, uh, what took place there? Do you know what those questions were? Yeah, Loring Air Force Base incident, a security policeman's walking a perimeter and the weapons storage area, and the WSA, of course, is nuclear weapon storage area. The Air Force doesn't identify it as a, air, a nuclear weapon storage area. And this security policeman is walking guard duty. And he sees his craft land. He goes up and tries to challenge it, thinking it's a helicopter first, because it, had, it landed in a little hilly area uh, northwest of the weapon storage area at Loring Air Force Base. And he radioed in that it was a helicopter. And they said, no, there's, there's no helicopters in the area. It can't be a helicopter. So he, as he walked up, he sees these two entities walking towards him. And oh, these wow. entities were not human. Mm -hmm. And he described them as ha large helmets and long arms. And one of them is carrying some kind of an object, which he thought was a weapon. And so he challenged them with his M16. And he kept challenging. They kept walking, walking, walking up to him. And then next thing you know, his weapon is taken out of his hands, floated, he says, floated away from him. Now he does have a, a, a sidearm, a 38 caliber handgun. Right. So he went to reach for the handgun, but it's not there. That went with the M16. Mm. Now he is disarmed. Now he doesn't know what to do. Yeah.